Okay, well, on page 22, I have a little diagram about the law. I gave a, an introduction in um, uh, this chapter on playing with fire about being at a wedding, and uh, I wanted you to know I didn't I didn't make it up uh, about uh, uh, being at a wedding, and uh, at the end of the wedding, this uh, pastor, well-intentioned pastor, uh, dipped into Deuteronomy 28 to read uh, the blessings intended for Israel, and uh, so he was reading those blessings for this dear couple. And, uh, and I, I just happened to know uh, where it was from. He didn't necessarily tell us where he was reading, but uh, I, I recognized it in Deuteronomy 28. And uh, I thought that it was interesting as he spoke uh, about them that um, just uh, all these amazing blessings were supposed to come on this couple that were actually intended uh, for Israel. And uh, so let me just read some of Deuteronomy 28. I'll start at the beginning. Now it shall be that if you will diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments, which I command you today, the Lord will God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Wow, that's pretty heady for a newly married couple, isn't it? <laughs> to be set high above all the nations of the earth. Let all these blessings, and all these blessings shall, shall come upon you and overtake you if you will obey the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, blessed shall you be in the country. Doesn't matter where you live, you're going to be blessed, you know, young couple. Blessed shall be the offspring of your body and the produce of your ground and the offspring of your beast, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock. Wow, that's pretty neat. I mean, they're both teachers. <laughs> They're not farmers, but okay, if they, you know, raise some animals or plant a garden, it'll be blessed. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. Okay, just it's, it just covers about everything for this young couple. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. Wow. That's pretty uh, amazing. Gosh, I wonder that who, who might enemies be? I guess, who, uh, I don't know. Lawyers? Bankers? <laughs> uh, I don't know. So I just thought it was interesting how we use the Old Testament uh, when it, it suits our purposes. And, uh, and, and that's an interesting thing, but it's a, a problematic thing. And uh, so, uh, on page 22, this gives us a little bit of a covenantal framework to try to, to see and understand exactly uh, how this works. And uh, this is not unique to me. Uh, the general framework came from um, a, uh, an Old Testament scholar named Thomas Makomsky, and uh, he uh, taught at uh, Trinity, Evangelical Divinity School. I uh, hope he hasn't changed his mind on this. Uh, he went to be with the Lord just a few years ago but uh, a wonderful scholar, and uh, so this is kind of his, his general framework. He said that fundamental to um, our understanding of what God is doing in the world is uh, his covenant of blessing. Of course, it starts at creation, but it gets specified with Abraham, doesn't it? And Abram, you remember, means exalted father, and because God is going to use him to bless all the peoples, or nations of the world, all the people groups, that he has to have a name change from Abram, exalted father, to Abraham, father of many peoples. And uh, that's who he is, and uh, that's the blessing that's promised him by the Lord. Land, seed, and this blessing to all the people groups of the world. And uh, so that's really foundational to uh, the seeing what God is doing in the world, at least from Genesis 12 and, and Abraham on. And uh, the Abrahamic blessing and Abrahamic covenant is repeated uh, in uh, total or in part at least three other times in Genesis uh, 12 initially, but then 15, chapter 15, chapter 17, and chapter 22. So it's uh, obviously uh, immensely important. And uh, the blessing is to be to all the tribes 
or uh, we would now say all the people groups, all the ethnic entities of the world, that's the blessing. Not to the nations, not a geopolitical unit, but these more enduring ethnic uh, tribal uh, units. And uh, so God promises universal blessing. And then that blessing gets uh, amplified through the Davidic covenant. And uh, God uh, promises to David that uh, not only will the blessing come through the, the seed of Abraham, but there will be a unique blessing from the Davidic line of the seed of Abraham uh, in terms of uh, helping to, to mediate and bring about this blessing. And that is uh, that there will be a kingdom forever that's promised to David's line. And uh, God will be a father to the Davidic king in the same way that he was a father to the nation. In Exodus 4.22, God says uh, to Moses to say to Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn son. And say that to Pharaoh and say, you need to let my firstborn son go. Well, those terms, firstborn and son, are then applied to the Davidic king that the Davidic king now is Psalm 89, verses 26 and 27, is the firstborn among all the nations and all the kings of the earth. And additionally, he is called the son. He enters into a special sonship relationship with God, has nothing to do with deity, but has everything to do with the Davidic kingship. And in the, in the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7, through 17, God says, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. And like I have done and will do with Israel, I will chasten him and discipline him when he goes uh, in a wayward way and all of that. So he blesses the nation of Israel through Abraham. He now blesses the Davidic king in a special way who acts in a sense as a representative of the nation and has a special uh, sonship relationship with God, and God will uh, chasten and discipline and guide the king. And because as the king goes, so the nation will go. So the seed of David is to help to provide direction and leadership for all of the seed of Abraham. And, uh, and, and, and so both of those are uh, astonishing covenants that are called covenants of blessing. Uh, not so much conditional, but uh, they are uh, uh, unconditional, that I will bless through this. Now, in, in saying that, then there obviously are two more covenants that are important, and this is not all the covenants. There's a Noe covenant and uh, some others uh, in there. But uh, McComsky comes up with a, I think this is a great term, that uh, there are other covenants that are not covenants of blessing, but they're administrative or housekeeping covenants. Now that may make it sound kind of mundane or uh, unimportant in that, but, th but these, are, these are beautiful, these are important covenants. And these uh, inform how God's people uh, are to obey the Lord and uh, that in, in their lifestyle and in their obedience then, it explains how they will be a means of experiencing the blessing and uh, they will be a means of proclaiming that blessing to all the peoples of the world. So uh, th this is, uh, it's uh, uh, an interesting uh, addition to uh, what, God has said to Abraham and to David. And uh, the Mosaic Law then, and um, the Mosaic Covenant, technically it, it runs uh, from Exodus 20, 20 through Deuteronomy 33, uh, but we tend to talk about uh, the first five books of the, of the Old Testament, uh, the Pentateuch, as, as being uh, explaining the Mosaic Covenant. But uh, this is Israel's terms of obedience for experiencing the Abrahamic blessing in the land, and this is an important clarifier. I think it's Leviticus 18.5 says, do this, keep this law, and you shall live. Now that's not live eternally, they weren't earning any eternal life, but you shall live and prosper in the land. 
don't keep this covenant and God will chasten you and discipline you. And the ultimate discipline, of course, will be to be removed from the land. And that's a part of the curses of Deuteronomy 28, isn't it? God is very specific. Now that's kind of the end of the line. That's the worst of all the, the disciplines that God will bring about. But he was very forthcoming uh, in this covenant that they had entered into with him, this housekeeping covenant. And so all of this, though the blessing of Israel was wonderful in and of itself, but they were also to be a means of blessing to all the peoples of the world. So, of course, God cares for his people, and of course he gives them a wonderful and a delightful life within the land if, if they are faithful to their covenant with him. But if they were not, he will chasten them and try to bring them back. And that's what the prophets, their role was to try to bring the people back to the covenant, to be faithful to it. That's the very nature of a covenant, isn't it? Uh, especially uh, what we, you know, uh, these covenants like this that involve two parties, that the person who, the, the great, greater person, uh, the, the, okay, let's put it in feudal terms, the landowner uh, is, uh, offers to enter into a covenant relationship with uh, the people working uh, his or her land, and uh, he will give them rights and privileges in the land and all this and that, and uh, the one thing he asks in return is their faithfulness to the covenant. Their faithfulness to the covenant. That's the whole crux of a covenant relationship, that the, this greater person who initiates his covenant to folks with less power and all of that, the only thing this greater person asks of them is that they would be faithful and honor the covenant. And that's what God asked of Israel. He had redeemed them, delivered them, saved them from Egypt, and had brought them into a land which uh, they were going to conquer, but they were going to get vineyards and cities and all that, that they didn't build the cities, they didn't plant the vineyards, they didn't plant the fields. They were going to, uh, God was going to give them to them uh, a, a, as a gift of his kindness. Uh, now they had to fight to get it, but they were going to be theirs and they would appreciate it when they got it. And, uh, and so all that he asked of them is to be faithful in the covenantal relationship. Now we call it law in, in, in that, and there is, uh, f from looking at Israel as a theocratic state, the, the law is like their constitution. There's a legal dimension, isn't it? But probably uh, equally important is the relational dimension. And uh, it's, if you're looking at it legally, God could say to them, you didn't obey my laws, you broke the law. Okay, and sometimes the Old Testament uses that, doesn't it? The prophets use that. But if we're looking at the covenant from the, through the relational perspective, it's that you were unfaithful, you were disloyal. And of course, the prophets uh, use the imagery of uh, a marriage and of the wife being unfaithful in the marriage. Uh, and uh, of course, Hosea is the classic example, that, that prophet. Uh, he married a woman who was um, a wayward woman, prostitute sort of woman, and um, married, they had what, three kids, and then she went back to her prostituting ways, and, uh, and it was very destructive. And Hosea then could understand uh, what God's heart was experiencing, because Hosea's heart experienced that, didn't he? The brokenness of unfaithfulness. Uh, now, there was a happy ending in that he went years later and bought her back as his wife because she had become enslaved. She was on, uh, in the marketplace as a slave and he bought her back and he cleansed her and purged her and, and took her back as his wife. And so there's a happy ending in that story, like there will be a happy ending for Israel on down the line. But we're, we don't know when that's going to happen, but we're a ways We've come a long way, so waiting for that, haven't we? So it's a covenantal relationship, and the nature of it, as Paul says in Galatians 3, is that it's an added sort of a thing. Uh, turn to Galatians 
chapter 3, verse 15 to 22, and uh, listen to what Paul says about the Mosaic Covenant being added to the Abrahamic Covenant. Now, in the previous section, uh, he was talking about the Abrahamic Covenant, verses 6 through 14, and so now he's going to bring in the Law Covenant or the Mosaic Covenant. Galatians 3, 15 and 22. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed that is Christ. In other words, Paul clearly sees the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant is in the seed of Abraham's uh, par excellent, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, Messiah Jesus. Verse 17, what I am saying is this, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Why the law then? It was added because of transgression, transgressions having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. In other words, the fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise looking to, uh, to and through the Davidic covenant to the ultimate Davidic King of Kings, uh, Jesus Messiah. Now, a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, that is eternal life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up all persons under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Okay, so the nature of the law is that it's an added thing and it doesn't negate the, the fundamental promissory covenant of Abraham of blessing. So then here's a question and you need to know this and answer this. How were people eternally saved? How were they eternally delivered in the Old Testament? Certainly from Abraham on, but even before Abraham. How did people gain eternal life? Based in the messianic promise. All right. They didn't gain it by keeping the law, Tyler? No, not one person. Since the fall of humanity, people have been given eternal life. It has been imparted to them by God's grace through faith. Now you say, well, what was the object of their faith? Well, it's the Creator God. And from Abraham on, it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who's the Creator God. And as the Revelation continues, that's it's a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who one day will send, uh, you know, the Messiah, the Anointed One. But that's a progressive thing, isn't it? And they are saved by grace through faith alone, plus nothing else, in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who created the world. That's how they were saved. The law then was added to show them about their transgressions and to show them as a covenant people how they were to live and how they were to experience the Abrahamic blessings in the land that God gave them. And again, that was never an end in of itself, but it was a means to the end of blessing all the peoples of the world. So it was a both and, wasn't it? Well, how did that work out? <laughs> How'd they do in the covenantal relationship? Not so well. It was a dismal failure, wasn't it? A dismal failure. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 2, verse 24. He is quoting Isaiah 52, 5 and Ezekiel 36, 20. So two of the prophets 
a pre-exilic and a post-exilic prophet, Isaiah and Ezekiel. And here's what they said, and Paul quotes, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles, among the peoples of the world, because of you. And he's talking to Israel, as it is written. Wow! The name of God is blasphemed among the peoples of the world. This nation was supposed to be a means of blessing to the peoples of the world and to lift up God's name, to honor God's name in the way that they lived in faithfulness to their covenant with him, uh, but they dismally failed, didn't they? And that's a great tragedy. And so Israel the son failed and the Davidic kings, essentially from Solomon on, Solomon was a mixed bag, but after that, they failed to be uh, faithful sons to the covenant and lead the nation into covenant faithfulness. And so Israel, the nation, failed. The Davidic Israel, the nation, the son, failed. The Davidic king, the sons, had a special sonship relationship with God, failed. And that sets the stage then for the ultimate king of kings, the ultimate Davidic king, Messiah, Messiah Jesus. And so the messianic son then will take upon his shoulders the task given to the nation to be a source of blessing to all the peoples of the world, to Israel the son, which the Davidic sons, Davidic king sons, failed to lead and, and guide that on the whole in, in that direction. And so Messiah the Son takes that upon his shoulders. And he will in fact then bring that to fulfillment and to blessing. And to do that then, he inaugurates that which was prophesied and anticipated, the new covenant. And uh, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, promises a new covenant with uh, terms of obedience uh, that will be easier <laughs> for God's people. Why will, what's, what's promised under the new covenant to make it easier? In Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, what's promised here? Yeah, Kyle. Uh, that the law will be placed on our hearts. All right. <laughs> they didn't do so well with the law written on the tablets of stone, did they, under the Mosaic covenant? And so God says, okay, I will write the law on the tablets of your heart. Of course, it's, the, it's, it's a picture of a greater intimacy and a greater understanding of the law. All right, what else does Jeremiah say? Good, maybe we should read that, appreciate that. What else does he say? Remember, Jeremiah 31, 31, 34. What else are we going to get? Under the new covenant. Forgiveness. forgiveness. Forgiveness of sins. The gift of forgiveness and of righteousness that will be given to God's people. And your sins and your lawless deeds I will remember no more. Wow, that's unbelievable. The author of Hebrews said, in Hebrews 10, being in verse 1, that the priests of Israel stood, and there was no, there were no chairs or seats <laughs> in the tent and in the tabernacle. Um, so they never could sit down. Their work was never ending. Why? Because the sin of Israel was never ending, was it? And so the priests stood ministering daily. Uh, uh, offering a sacrifice for sin, but the problem with the sacrifices was there was always the remembrance of sin, the awareness of sin. It was a never-ending thing. You just sacrifice for those sins for the year, and already there's a whole new tab, so to speak, of sins that are, you know, it started. And so it was an unending, and the remembrance of it in the nation, individually and collectively, was unending. But under the new covenant, God says, I will strike this new covenant and I will forgive them of their iniquity, in verse 34, and their sin I will remember no more. Wow. That's incredible, isn't it? That's incredible. 
So that's, uh, that's pretty amazing. And if that's all there was, that would be incredible in and of itself. Oh, but there's another passage that talks about the new covenant, isn't it? Where's that? Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36, verses 24 to 27. Ezekiel, a post-exilic prophet, now adds to the promise here. And he says, I will read that. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Does that include American Idol, do you think? No, oh, I don't know. Okay, more. <laughs> you hope so. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. And you will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers so as to be my people and I will be your God. So uh, an amazing covenant that he promises for Israel that we Gentiles have been grafted into that, haven't we? Under Jesus' gracious provision of that, when he inaugurates the new covenant. So, righteousness, the law written on our hearts, we'll know it more. We won't have to teach one another, do this or do that. It will be more of a sense of, of, of uh, internal knowledge of God and what he expects. And the Spirit will enable us, we'll have a new heart, a new decision-making matrix in terms of choosing these things. Uh, wow, that's an amazing thing, isn't it? And so the Mosaic Covenant is a superseded covenant, but we can still learn and be greatly instructed because it's a part of God's Word. And I would suggest to you that God expected them to obey it. Now, some of our theological systems say just the opposite. They say essentially the Old Covenant was given to show Israel that she could not earn eternal life, that she could not commend herself to God through her works. And so its purpose was kind of uh, a, a covenant of frustration, uh, a covenant uh, of, okay, see if you can do this, and of course you can't do it. And the goal of that, and this is a good Lutheran term, was to drive them ultimately to the foot of the cross because they couldn't do it. Well, okay, there may be a little bit of truth in that, but um, I, I don't think that was... It's not what the Old Testament says, not what the law says about itself, that God gave it to them and He expected them to keep it. If they didn't, He chastened them. Did He expect them to keep the law perfectly? No. Why? How do you know that? Sacrificial system, of course. Built in the very fabric of it is the sacrificial system. So He didn't expect them to keep it perfectly. Okay. He provided for their continual imperfection through uh, sacrifices, substitutes who, whose death uh, and their blood covered their sins so that they didn't have to die. So um, I don't think the primary purpose of the law was just to be a frustration for Israel and a thorn in her side. Uh, now, uh, ultimately, she didn't keep it and God graciously inaugurated a new covenant. But I don't think he gave it to her and saying, I, you know, you'll never keep this, so I'm going to give it to you just to, you know, force you to uh, uh, rely on me. Of course, he wanted him to rely on him, but it wasn't, a, it wasn't a primarily a frustration factor for that. Additionally, the covenant had nothing to do with eternal life. It had everything to do with earthly temporal life within the land. They weren't earning anything eternally by keeping the law. They were simply being faithful to the covenant in the land. Yeah, Tyler. But, I mean, isn't Luther's statement of still being um, integrous to you know, Galatians? I think it's Galatians three twenty four, right, where he says that it was yeah. the tutor, in fact, to lead them to Jesus. So it is even cross, but it does seem like that it was intended as also a means to say, "Hey, you can't do this." Okay. 
Well, uh, let's look at Galatians. Um, I was going to look at that a little bit later, but let's look at it now. The, actually, Paul uses two uh, images of the law in, uh, in Galatians uh, 3 and 4. Let's look, um, we've already read one, uh, beginning in verse 22, but then the next paragraph, um, we pick up some more. Galatians 3, 22, but the scripture has shut up all under sin that the promise by faith in Christ might be given to those who believe. Now he's talking about in, in verse 21 on there, and the whole paragraph, about the law. The law served as, the imagery here is of a jailer, of shutting up all who knew the law in Israel under sin. It locked them up uh, and appointed them uh, to, ultimately to faith, and the object of that faith ultimately was going to be the faith in the Messiah. So it, for those in Israel who had the law, it, it locked them up. They knew because of their failure to keep the law, and again, I don't think this was the primary purpose of it, but it wasn't given to them to give them eternal life. It was given to them to be faithful to the covenant, and they, and they failed in that, and, and that did then point them to the coming of the Messiah. But I don't think that was the primary purpose of it. Uh, but he continues in verse 23, Galatians 3, 23. But then, but before faith came, what do you mean before faith came? Wasn't there faith in the Old Testament? Yes, of course. But this is faith in the Messiah. That's what he's talking about, faith in Jesus. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore the law has become our tutor, pedagogue, pedagogue, what we would say, to lead us to Christ, that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Now the imagery here is of, a, of a, usually a son of a wealthy person, and uh, there would be, a, in a Roman family, there would be a Greek slave, uh, usually better educated than anybody in the household, and uh, that slave would tutor the child uh, when the child was younger, but then this, the slave, the pedagogue, would take the child to the master teacher, and uh, so the master teacher ultimately could teach them. And so, the, the law was not only a jailer, but it was a tutor. It was to instruct and prepare in terms of redemptive history until, uh, uh, and to take the child to the master teacher. Well, of course, the image he's building for is now in the fullness of time uh, with the inauguration of the new covenant, Jesus is that master teacher. And the law's tutorial function has ceased because now the child, and this is Ephesians, or Galatians 4, 1 through 7, now the child is an adult and doesn't need the tutor. Galatians 4, 1. I say as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. And that's an amazing phrase. The uh, uh, stoicheia to cosmu, the elementary things or elementary spirits of the world could refer to teachings, elemental teachings, or it could refer to uh, the spirits demonic spirits, if you will, uh, and, and our own Clint Arnold has done some wonderful writing on that, uh, th that held God's people in bondage. Verse 4, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Now Paul's whole point, and this is a, kind of one of those uh, a child, uh, a developmental arguments from childhood to adulthood. The picture of the old covenant believers as a whole is that they were 
uh, underage, they were children, therefore they needed the law as a tutor, and it also acted as a jailer to shut them up under sin. But in the fullness of time, in redemptive history, when the Messiah came and inaugurated the new covenant and a, a whole new uh, relational dynamic with God, then at that point now, God's people are viewed as adults and they're out from under the need for uh, the tutorial and uh, uh, jailer functions of the law. And of course the point that Paul's making, and he makes it in the next one, is uh, why in the world then would you want to turn back again to that preparatory inferior era in redemptive history? You've already been through that under the Mosaic Law. The fullness of time has come. The Messiah has come. He's inaugurated a new covenant. You are heirs now and have a right and privilege uh, of, of adult heirs and the Spirit dwells in you, why, why would you want to go back to that era? So uh, this is, you know, I think Paul's in the New Testament's picture of how the new covenant has come in the fullness of time and has superseded the Mosaic covenant. And uh, again, people weren't saved by keeping the Mosaic covenant. They were saved like Father Abraham by grace through faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the Creator God. So the, the new covenant simply builds on that, saved by grace through faith in God, now specifically revealed in Jesus Christ, and uh, now we are also under a covenant, a housekeeping covenant, if you will, with far more gracious and enabling terms. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? It's incredible. So we're looking at a covenant that Israel cherished that made her special, the Mosaic Covenant. And uh, it was, okay, it was like uh, your, your first car. Maybe it's a 1970 beat up Volkswagen Beetle, you know, that needs a paint job and, and it does run and, and all of that. But you think this is the most incredible car in the world. And, uh, and then later on, you're given a brand new Lexus or Mercedes and you say, oh my goodness, this is, this is a really, really nice car. And by comparison, this really, really nice luxury car is so much nicer than that old Volkswagen Beetle, isn't it? But when all you had was a Volkswagen Beetle, you thought that was the greatest thing in the world. And, and, and that's what Israel, with their Volkswagen Beetle, if you will, uh, there weren't luxury cars uh, at that point. But now there is a luxury car. It's the new covenant, and it supersedes the old covenant. Okay, let me pause now. This is, this is important. Important that you know people in the Old Testament weren't, weren't saved by earning their salvation, by keeping Mosaic covenant. They were not. That was their means of expressing their faithfulness to the faith that they already had. Yeah, Andrew. Um, it, uh, Paul says the same thing uh, in Galatians. Um, Galatians 3.19. It was added because of transgressions. In other words, uh, and this is a constant theme in Romans. He says it in uh, uh, 3.20. He says it in 4.15. Romans 4.15. He says it in 5.20. He says it in 6.14. Uh, and then all Romans 7, is the, the purpose of the law was to point out how sinful sin was. That was a part of its function as a jailer, to point that out, and as a tutor. Pardon? Yeah, yes, certainly. And, but now Paul here, see, I, I mean, in this discussion, it, if we think this is all Paul believes about the law, it, it's a fairly negative view of the law, isn't it? It's focusing on the law's in, in the salvation history, its redemptive historical purpose and its, and its limitations in light of the New Covenant. But that's not all Paul believes about the law, of course, Th but he's dealing with a specific issue and a specific problem. So he is saying true things and bringing out that, but, but it's just, you know, one facet of the whole thing. 
Obviously, if it had just a totally only a negative function, why would it, why would we have Psalm 119? You know, with a what a hundred and it's 122 times eight, 176 verses praising the law, God's revelation. See, they thought it was wonderful. But in terms of redemptive history, uh, with the coming of the new covenant, then we, we can see it in a slightly different light and appreciate some of these other dimensions to it. But Paul wasn't a law hater. He said in Romans 7, it's good and righteous and holy. That wasn't a problem. Yeah, all right. So if, uh, like, like you said, uh, the Mosaic Covenant, the law could be obeyed, even though the, in the Mosaic Covenant there are its uh, limitations, things like that, it doesn't have the Holy Spirit. My question is, then to what degree uh, were people under the Mosaic Covenant able to fulfill uh, being the blessing to all the nations of the Abrahamic covenant? It's pretty checkered. Probably the, 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 maybe the best time they did that was during David's reign and perhaps in the early part of Solomon's reign. Uh, remember, because he plays a tragic role in scripture, is Uriah the Hittite <laughs> served in David's army. Well, he wasn't an Israelite. He was from one of the people of the land who had apparently believed, we would assume, in the God of Israel and had, you know, come in and joined. And there were, you know, perhaps thousands of others like that. And so they had, they began to kind of fulfill that function. Uh, and perhaps in Solomon, where people came from all over the world to see the glory of Solomon's uh, uh, palace and then, you know, the, the temple and that. Uh, but it was all pretty well downhill from there. There's little, you know, revivals along the way, but it basically was a downward spiral. So, so no, I don't think they did. And at least Isaiah and Ezekiel didn't think they did. <laughs> so, yeah. So can you say that most important letters was letters directed to the uh, people who are in the Mosaic covenant, or the Old covenant, maybe his letters about people, Galatians, who were Jews, Maybe all the most letters were directed to, to Jews only. Well, uh, I think P Paul touches on this issue in Galatians and in Romans and a little bit in Philippians, little tiny little bit in Colossians, because he's dealing with opponents uh, coming, Jewish opponents, uh, Judaizers, who are saying to the Gentiles, "You need to." Uh, you need to continue to keep the law and be circumcised and, and this and that, not to necessarily to earn your salvation, but because this is the marks of identity that God's people have always had. And in cultures that are conservative and conserve and value tradition, wow, that's a pretty strong argument, isn't it? Uh, and, and probably the assumption was of the, of the Jewish people, even the Jewish people that believed in Jesus, this is Acts 15, verses 1 and 5. Some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed said, hey, these Gentiles need to be circumcised and keep the, the yoke of Torah, carry the yoke of Torah. They need to be under the Mosaic Covenant. And so perhaps the assumption was when Messiah came, this would be the golden era of the Mosaic Law. And it will, the, the, under Messiah, he will spread the Mosaic Covenant over all, all the world. And uh, Paul's point is, uh, no, it's not the golden era of the law. It's the fact that the law's purpose in salvation history has ended. And now a new, far better covenant has been inaugurated. And so Paul and his arguments in Galatians and Romans, Philippians, is making it unthinkable to want to roll back the calendar and go back in salvation history to an earlier, what now functions as a preparatory and by comparison, an inferior covenant. And that's why the argument in Hebrews, comparing the new to the old, is the new is better, 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 better. You know, at least 13 times author uses that, says that. But it's, it's not saying this was innately inferior. It's just in terms of its function in salvation history, it has been superseded by covenant that is far more gracious, with far more enablement for God's people. So as uh, John says in John 1, uh, you know, it's grace on top of grace <laughs> has come through Jesus. And the Mosaic Covenant was gracious, but the New Covenant is 
even more gracious in a sense. So, it's just, yeah. It's related to my question, piggybacking yeah. off what Lydia was asking, but again, then, yeah, even if the new covenant is far, far better, or even in your yeah. analogy of like the Chevy yeah. and the Mercedes, though, like if the Chevy still works to some degree, then like, what if people just want to stick to it? Because well, you, if you're gonna argue, well, it still can work to some degree. Like, do you like necessarily have to, you know, throw it out? <laughs> well, y you don't have to throw it out. You can keep living by it. If you want to have your sins paid for. Uh, you know, it would help to believe in Jesus. Uh, if you want to have the indwelling Holy Spirit, uh, you better believe in Jesus. Uh, but if you don't want either of those, uh, uh, th and if you th then, assuming then that Jesus isn't who he said he was, you know, the Messiah, you know, God incarnate, uh, then you have to end up de facto saying he's an accursed man and deserved to be hung on a tree. So yeah, if you want to go that way, sure, you can do that. And uh, uh, most of Israel has done that, haven't he, the Jewish people. Um, now, if you want to keep living by the provisions of the Mosaic Covenant at a cultural level, that's okay. If you want to just treat it as, if you're Jewish and you believe in Jesus as Messiah, then yeah, you can continue to keep the Sabbath and keep the holy days and um, the food laws and that. But clearly in the New Testament, the point is it has been reduced to culture. And the firewall, <laughs> that you're not to cross is to make, it, uh, to make it more than culture, to make it theology, and to foist it on the Gentiles. And that's heretical, Paul says. You cross the line. So it's okay to keep it culturally. And, and the Jewish people can do that, and Messianic synagogues are doing that. But they need to be vigilant that they don't, in doing that, at some point say, and everybody needs to be doing that. Then it moves from culture to theology. Maybe. And that's where you get problem. Yeah, Andrew. What about the more like severe laws though? You know, I mean, it, we wouldn't think it was okay if the Messianic Jews were stoning their children for different things, right? Is that? No. So how do so no. like they themselves have to parse out the Old Testament? Right, well, because those were given for a theocratic state, weren't they? Now. Uh, it's the times of the Gentiles. We live in, 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 you know, basically Gentile nations all over the world. So you can't take those theocratic ordinances and, and uh, yeah, use those today. N not at all. Um, and so all the clearly, the, the ones that had, it kind of were functioned as governmental laws within the theocratic state, no, that has ended. That theocratic state does not exist in Israel now. It's, this is the times of the Gentiles. And so we, the New Testament makes it clear we're to live under the laws uh, of, of the civil authorities of the Gentiles. Is yes? The passage that Jesus actually mentioned this type of, uh, like, he didn't mention person, or it was sort of a Paul's view after Jesus, you know, Yeah, when did Jesus mention a new covenant? Pardon? Last Supper, for sure. That's when he mentioned it, isn't it? It's the new covenant, it's inaugurating it in his blood. Up to that point, he lived under the old covenant, as did all the disciples and everybody else. But he says, upon his death, burial, and resurrection, he'll be inaugurating a new covenant, and then we gotta throw Pentecost in there too, when the Spirit, he pours out the Spirit on his people. <coughs> So that series of events, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and the pouring out of the Spirit, uh, all of those are a part of the inauguration of the New Covenant. Where does Seventh-day Adventists stand? Seventh-day Adventists? Yeah. Um, they would still be living by the food laws, 
uh, and other pretty things. In Sabbath, yes, under the uh, under the Mosaic Covenant. Okay, um, uh, short answer. Um, uh, historically, uh, evangelicals considered uh, Seventh-day Adventism as a cult, historically. Now, uh, the difficulty with that is there are, there is an evangelical movement and wing and dimension within Seventh-day Adventism. And uh, at the... Uh, uh, Evangelical Theological Society meeting, there is a Seventh-day Adventist uh, study group that's a part of that. And so these are people who believe that are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and own plus nothing. But they still have these other practices. So that would be cultural. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, up to, uh, somewhat. Yeah, well, and they probably don't foist it, uh, wouldn't try to foist it on others. I, uh, uh, because if they did, it would be theological, wouldn't it? Well, yes, but yeah. you're saying that's a part from the mainstream. Yeah, okay. it's a sub -su subset, it's a part of Seventh-day Adventism, and it's caused uh, some folks to say, okay, step back and say, all right, uh, if you can be a part of that and be a believer in Jesus, is it really a cult and that so? Uh, yeah, it's raised all kinds of issues. So it's still, this is still something that's being worked out. I don't, I don't have an you know, opinion because I haven't studied it a lot, but, uh, but good, good questions. Okay, now, there's lots of different types of legal material, and those are listed in KBH. Uh, maybe I should go. Uh, there's... Uh, uh, laws, uh, casuistic law, uh, if then, or uh, here's a condition, there's a penalty, uh, apodictic law, absolute law, do this, like the uh, Ten Commandments. There's collections of certain laws, kind of a legal series, there's legal instruction, you know, through prose. Lots of different types of law, just like in every genre, there's lots of uh, subsets to that, aren't there? Okay, so we've already kind of talked about this, and now I'm on um, page. Uh, 52, is the Mosaic Law binding for us today? In a word, no. Not as a whole law binding on us. Why? It's not as a covenant. It is not binding. It's not as a whole covenant binding. And uh, the, the New Testament makes that clear. But in saying that, there are uh, parts of the o Old Testament law that are carried forward into the New Testament and are repeated there, aren't they? How many of the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament? Like, honor your mother and father. How many of them? Nine of them. What's the only one not repeated? Sabbath. Sabbath. Right? That's the only one that doesn't come forward. So the other nine are mentioned as a part of the, the New Covenant. Uh, so it's not a it's a to not a total cutting off and ignoring of it, but there is a, a, a selective bringing forward of these, uh, you know, uh, wonderful truths uh, into the new covenant. But the point is, the old covenant, the Mosaic law, as a covenant, its covenantal authority has ended, and now we're under a new covenantal authority. And uh, here are all these passages that you have on page 52 that uh, uh, spell that out and, and, and make that clear. Uh, Paul says uh, to the Romans that uh, in, in Romans 6.14 is kind of the fastest, quickest quote that I can make here. He says, For sin shall not be master over you. Why? For you are not under law, but under grace. And the point is, when uh, it was the year of the law, sin was still in mastery over human bodies. Hey, during the year of the law. But Paul says, you're not in the year of the law, you're in the year of the grace, the new covenant, and therefore, sin's master, sin is not in mastery over you. Why? Well, separating the grace from the old covenant, the new covenant from the old, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah, where he conquered sin's mastery over bodies. <laughs> so, yeah. Eric, if you want to live under the old covenant, I you, you got to give that... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to be on your case the rest of the semester here, Eric, <laughs> trying to draw you into the new here. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, okay, so uh, it, it's, you know, it's relatively clear as a whole law is not binding and it has been personalized in Jesus Christ. He's the telos or the end of the law, Romans 10, 4. It's uh, been replaced with something appropriate for the end of the age, fullness of time, Galatians 4, 4 and 5. And it's also uh, been internationalized. We have the people of God now that are all over the planet uh, and the vast majority of them are Gentiles. But there's a growing number of Messianic Jews, praise the Lord, that have, in, you know, recent years. And, uh, and so uh, there's a wonderful article in your course pack, in the, in the back of it, that's not assigned, okay? So this is for the over, overachievers, uh, or, or those who feel guilty if they don't, <laughs> don't read it now that I mentioned it. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. But there is a wonderful article on the Mosaic Law in your, in your readings, in your course pack. Uh, and it, it explains how the law was particularized for a certain people in a certain part of the world. And a lot of the health things and the food things, there were very you know, specific reasons for those in that area. Uh, and now, when we're dealing with the people of God spread all over the globe, literally, uh, obviously then things have been internationalized beyond ethnic Israel and uh, as appropriate for Gentile sons and daughters. So that's a cool thing. Uh, in uh, Playing With Fire, pages 127, 128, I suggest that um, here's the primary contribution to our spiritual formation from studying the law. To explain how God relates to us within a covenantal relationship and how His holiness and Israel's sin could be reconciled through Israel's obedience to the covenant. Within this covenant relationship, covenantal relationship, the law also demonstrates the concrete, practical, and multifaceted areas in which God's people should obey and be transformed. And so that's, that's very instructive to us, all the specificity of it. Isn't it interesting that you can see how uh, obedience to God, being in covenant relationship with Him in Israel, it was supposed to touch every area of life and all these relationships. Now, I think a secondary contribution is to give us ethical and moral illustrations of godly responses to a wide variety of life situations. And there are certain issues that aren't spoken of in the, in the New Covenant, and we really then uh, look back uh, to the Old Covenant. What, what would be one of the most vivid ones that we're, you know, culturally wrestling with now? Not addressed in the New Covenant. How about abortion? Okay, we draw heavily from, uh, you know, what the... Uh, uh, the provisions about that under, under the Old Covenant. So, Here's the key phrase. Uh, I think it's helpful. It's kind of a glib one-liner, but I do. It's not unique to me. The Old Covenant is still revelatory of who God is and his, how He operates in covenantal relationship. It is still revelatory to be read and studied, even if it is not still regulatory. And, and so that's a, don't throw it out because it's not regulatory, because it's a part of God's Word and it is still wonderfully revelatory. Now in that light, I'd hope to have a little more time to talk about Leviticus 16, but what did you learn about God from studying uh, the Day of Atonement? Leviticus 16, was it 1 to 22? What did you learn <coughs> about God and about sin or... God's relationship with Israel and her sin. What did you learn from that passage? Pardon? It's very, very specific, isn't it? All right? Three animals, two goats and a bull. Okay? Very specific. A lot of blood. You ever been around uh, somebody who was slaughtering an animal? Something as big as a, you know, a cow? A bull? No. You have? It's not real pleasant, is it? There's something, there's a distinctive smell, I'm not trying to gross you out, but there's a distinctive smell of warm blood from an animal. And, uh, I mean, they probably became skillful at it, but they're still, uh, again, when they slit their throat and, you know, captured the blood, there's a, there's a, there's a splashing of it, uh, and, and it's ugly and messy, isn't it? 
But sin is ugly and messy, isn't it? And the death that comes through sin is horrifyingly ugly and messy. And so it was a pretty vivid example, wasn't it? You kill the bull to, to cleanse the priest in the tabernacle. Uh, you kill the goat to sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat. And then you put your hands on the head of the other goat, and that's the scapegoat, and you send it out in the wilderness. And isn't it astonishing that Jesus fulfills and does all of those things for us under the new covenant? And scriptures don't specifically say this, but there's a sense in which while he's dying on the cross and bleeding and suffocating, that in a sense, as the scapegoat and as a sacrificial lamb, that the sins of the whole world get laid on him, on his head. Isn't that amazing to think about the fulfillment of that? And it was bloody and messy and incredibly painful, just like it was bloody and messy on the Day of Atonement. But the good news now is the Day of Atonement. What does atonement mean? Yom Kippur, Day of Kippur. What does Kippur mean? Day of covering. It's no longer a day of covering, is it? No. Sins are not covered now. They're not put on hold now once and for all. Hebrews 10, 1 through 18. Nine, six different times. Once for all. Done. Complete. That Jesus is paid for in his death the sins of the world. And so now the issue is not sin. It's what are you going to do about Jesus Christ? Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.